Here's Johnny. Come and play with us, Johnny. The Shining has been parodied or referenced through countless shows and movies like The Simpsons, <gasps> Give Me the Bat, <gasps> Give Me the Bat, Come on, Give Me the Bat, South Park. You may need to do something rather extreme, if I may say so, Mr. Marsh. Two Toy Story references. <laughs> Ready Player One. <laughs> and most recently by Brian Cranston in a Mountain Dew commercial. Here's Mountain Dew Zero. I am thirsty. And this is just a testament to its lasting effect on our minds. Only grossing about 600000 at its release, it has now managed to bring in about $44 million. So, what makes The Shining so special? People have discussed and theorized over this film for decades, even leading to the making of the documentary Room 237, full of some bizarre theories, like the movie being a metaphor for the Holocaust, the film being Kubrick's confirmation that he faked the moon landing in 1969, and that the film is a parallel to the genocide of the Native American people. Some people even believe that a minor detail, like a crushed red Volkswagen in the blizzard, is a reference to Kubrick omitting some of Stephen King's source material, since that's what the Torrance family originally drove in the book. While some of these theories have basis for discussion, most of them just come from obsessed fans that have been mesmerized by this film for decades. I first watched The Shining in high school, and since then it hasn't really left my mind, and with every rewatch, I find something new to appreciate. So. I did a little bit of research, and here's why I think The Shining is the greatest horror film ever made. The Shining doesn't really fit the mold for traditional horror films where the gore and the monsters are the scariest elements, but most of the horror in the movie comes in the form of psychological horror. NoFilmSchool.com defines psychological horror as an assault on our hearts and minds and it purposefully messes with what's inside of us, making us feel uneasy and outside of the norm. There's plenty to feel uneasy about throughout The Shining, but what makes this psychological horror so effective? Well, it's because we're seeing our own lives on display as Americans and human beings. Alright, that was a lot, so let me elaborate a little. I found a quote from an essay written by Steven Snyder on the film titled Family Life and Leisure Culture in The Shining, and it describes this relationship perfectly. At the hotel, Jack does none of the work for which he was hired. Instead, he spends his first weeks in a solitary game of catch with the tennis ball days of play. It is Wendy who keeps the heating in operation, fixes the meals, and stays in contact with the outside world. The closest Jack gets to implements of the lodge occurs when he dismantles the snowcat and the radio, two vehicles of external contact. By his drive for complete privacy and his adherence to empty formalities of corporate legality, Jack has ensured his own personal atrophy. He can release only the most demonic ghosts of his escapist American heritage. Grady, Lloyd, and with singular devotion, the slogan, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. The phrase spreads across his pages in the various shapes of grammatical repose, which disclose the external alterations of a kind of form with none of the internal pressure by which form grows organically into being. The imagination is dead, poised between the artificial opposites of work and play, and subject to control by the external ghosts of the American dream which inhabit the resort and remaining threads of his fantasy life. That was a mouthful, so I'll break it down a little bit more. In the American dream, we always impose a false sense of urgency on ourselves to work constantly with no breaks until we're drained of our own humanity. In reality, Jack spends most of his time in the movie not doing anything at all while Wendy does all the work. Do you feel bad? No. It's a little bit tired. Then why don't you go to sleep? I can't. You got too much to do. Yet, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy? By the way, he also fails to uphold the contract he's so committed to. Has it ever occurred to you that I have agreed to look after the Overlook Hotel until May the 1st? Does it matter to you at all that the owners have placed their complete confidence and trust in me and that I have signed a letter of agreement, a contract? And even the new contract he made with Delbert Grady to kill his family. I fear you will 
have to deal with this matter in the harshest possible way, Mr. Torres. That is the only thing to do. There's nothing I look forward to with greater pleasure, Mr. Grady. You give your word on that deal, Mr. Torres? I give you my word. In the end, his efforts to work constantly were futile. I think seeing Jack's desire for isolation so that he can work leading to his escalating insanity is like holding up a mirror to the audience. We see ourselves and those we love in the Torrances. Often we lose our humanity in the conquest for success. Now I want to talk about some of the more supernatural elements of the film that make The Shining the greatest horror film of all time. Red Rock. I think a lot of things happened right here in this particular hotel over the years. And not all of them was good. What about room 237? Room 237 is interesting because they're told to stay out of room 237 from the beginning. Danny knows it's a terrible place from its visions, but Halloran tells Danny not to acknowledge it at all. Mr. Halloran, what is in room 237? Nothing. There ain't nothing in room 237. But you ain't got no business going in there anyway. So stay out. You understand? Stay out. But later, we learn of the horrors that have transpired and are locked away in room 237. Carol Clover wrote an article titled Her Body Himself that discusses common horror tropes. In this article, she mentions the terrible place. She describes it as this. Into such houses, unwitting victims wander in film after film, and it is the conventional task of the genre to register in close detail the victim's dawning understanding as they survey the visible evidence of the human crimes and perversions that have transpired there. That perception leads directly to the perception of their own immediate peril. Room 237 is The Shining's terrible place, as well as the Overlook itself. Room 237 holds where Danny is bruised and where Jack commits adultery. Room 237 hides what Mr. Grady did to his wife and daughter years ago. Room 237 also shows Jack the facade of the hotel. Everything appears fine, but is actually old and rotten, and not what it seems. Jack tries to lie to his wife about Room 237. Did you find anything? No, nothing at all. What about those bruises on his neck? I think he did it to himself. But Room 237 will come out eventually. Even though Jack closed Danny's door while talking to Wendy to keep him oblivious, he shined to listen to what they were saying. Mr. Grady tried to lie to Jack about being the caretaker and not killing his daughters, but eventually he confessed to persuade Jack to murder. Jack tells Wendy that if she lets him out, he will forget the whole thing. Let me out of here and I'll forget the whole goddamn thing. It'll be just like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Clearly this was a lie. Ignoring past sins is what 237 is all about. Jack did the same thing with Danny whenever he broke his arm. It was three goddamn years ago. It was an accident. Could have happened to anybody. As long as I live, she'll never let me forget what happened. Room 237 represents the sins that we try to hide. Try as we might to shove everything under the rug and pretend that everything is fine, it'll be released from its terrible place eventually, in a way that we cannot contain. talked a lot about the film itself, but not much about its director, Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick has been known across all of his films to have a very keen attention to detail. He has this obsession with the perfect shot, and some actors reported that they shot scenes over a hundred times to get it exactly how he envisioned it. In the Room 237 documentary, they reported that Kubrick was seen placing props exactly how he wanted them. And yet, with this meticulous attention to detail, there are countless errors in the film, such as the typewriter changing colors, the chair in the lounge disappearing while Wendy's talking to Jack, and maybe most famously of all, Kubrick jumping the 180 axis in the bathroom while Jack's talking to Mr. Grady. While these could just be continuity errors, you'd think somewhere around the 90th take someone would have noticed something was off. I think Kubrick had something a little bit more in mind. I believe that this is Kubrick's way of displaying dissonance in the film, where our eyes and our brains are experiencing two different things furthering the subconscious psychological horror. The hotel is distorting reality and we don't even notice it. There's a really interesting interview with the inventor of the Steadicam, who was also the Steadicam operator for The Shining, Garrett Brown. And uh, he talks a bit about this effect and how that played into the cinematography. And there's something about the 
quality of the motion of the study cam in that film, which is supernaturally smooth, that doesn't feel like a normal objective movie moving shot, which are, you know, God's eye view, the director's eye view, whatever. They feel like the hotel's eye view. It feels like the hotel's eye view because that's what Kubrick intended. The smooth steady cam shot that's following Danny through the maze feels like the hotel or Jack following him through the maze. Kubrick's attention to details like these makes this film stand out above others. And the film's actors like Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Danny Lloyd, Scatman Crothers, and so many more made the film the pop culture icon that it is today. But their performances didn't come without sacrifice. One of the most well-known facts about this film is that Shelley Duvall was emotionally abused on set by Stanley Kubrick during production. We're killing ourselves out here and you're going to be ready. I am too, I'm standing so we play right by mood the music? Door. No, I can't Yeah, but when here. you came out like this, you said it is. You were you sitting there because I say, wait yeah. a minute, okay. and then you say yeah. on the radio, But when you go. do it, you've got to look desperate, Shelley. You're just wasting everybody's time. Kubrick's controversial, abusive behavior contributed to Duvall's insanity both on and off screen. Call this commitment to your craft, or call it being a terrible human being. Unfortunately, it's probably both. Despite what he did, even Duvall notes that without Kubrick, she would have never been able to give the performance that we see on screen. If it hadn't been for that, you know, volley of ideas, and sometimes butting of heads together, it wouldn't have come out as good as it did. And it also helps get the emotion up and the concentration up because it builds up anger, actually, and you, you get more out of yourself. And he knew that, and he knew he was getting more out of me by doing that. So it was sort of like a game. In 2020, we have had decades to dissect and appreciate this film, which has led to many new fans of the horror genre, including myself. Most notably, the success of The Shining allowed a follow-up novel written by Stephen King in 2013 titled Doctor Sleep. It made its way to the big screen in 2019, and while it wasn't quite as saturated with detail and innovative filmmaking achievements, Mike Flanagan and Ewan McGregor teamed up to expand the fascinating Shining universe in an unforgettable way. The film has also taken on a new meaning in 2020 because we all experienced the shining ourselves this year. Well, that is uh, quite a story. Sheltering inside, protected from the forces of nature for months on end until isolation drives us insane. I thought that it was what the old timers used to call cabin fever, kind of claustrophobic reaction, which can occur when people are shut in together over long periods of time. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. Yikes. And I'm going to finish this video off with one last quote from the Stephen Snyder article. To break from nature is to open oneself to the demons of civilization, demons born out of the urge for imperialistic order through which it has ascended.